Um, were there any quick questions from the audience? Bearing in mind, we've got. Ah, yes. Thank you very much. We've got a microphone, so let's keep it short, but happy to hear from you. Hi, my name is Felipe. I'm from Brazil. I uh, have a company called Renature in Am Amsterdam. We work with regenerative agriculture and agroforestry. So I'd like to know more about impact investment in this area of ag 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 regenerative agriculture <laughs> and if there is something moving on in this, at this stage. Thank you. Thanks. France has taken a great interest in Brazil's forests recently, so <laughs> that's a, a pertinent question. Thank you. Um, uh, first, uh, for the panel, I'm not sure which one of you might like to um, address uh, Jean's uh, suggestion about uh, accounting and uh, how that whether you how you see that idea does it, um, working or perhaps it's already working. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, no, I fully agree. I, I, I think that indeed we need to integrate this, this third pillar of impact alongside the traditional risk return pillars that are traditionally used in all investment decisions. I really think that it will become the, the norm, that it will become mainstream because we don't have any choice anymore in a world with finite resources. However, we are not there yet. And I think that's why we need this impact fund, we need these impact investors to change the approach to investments. On the Brazil um, question, we, we spoke about this before the, the panel because we're conscious that uh, many of, the, all of the panelists actually are interested in, in European, um, supporting European um, entrepreneurs. Um, but we don't want to ignore the, the, rest, the rest of the world either. Um, Sophia, you and I touched briefly on how there is a really interesting dynamic ecosystem elsewhere in the world, but it's quite different to the one we know. Could you outline perhaps some of the differences? Hi, everyone. Um, so indeed, I think there is a lot, usually um, a bit of confusion between what we mean by impact investment. And I think it can be um, kind of classified in two ways. Geographically, when we talk about sort of more the emerging countries, it would be just having capital in developing businesses is sometimes just considered as, as impact investment because you're creating development. Here it's different. Here it would be more about are you either solving um, a national challenge, which is in country like France, usually tackled by the government, like homelessness, elderly, all those very complex challenges, and you find a business model that is more sustainable and profitable. And now I think we're ref like more like representative of sort of a new wave of investors that take on the most complex global systemic challenge and require more radical solutions that can un unlock market opportunities and, um, and grow really fast. So it's really kind of different and today everything is kind of considered as impact investment because one of the core um, objective is indeed to solve uh, very important problems. Does it answer your question? Yes, yeah. thanks. Hold on to the microphone. Florian might have something yeah. to add as well. <coughs> yeah, so hello everyone. When we started 10 years ago, we actually tried to do global kind of impact investing because we didn't know it 10 years ago if there's enough deal flow and opportunities, but we found out pretty quickly a uh, huge respect of trying to invest in the global south and you have to be an expert there and have people on the ground. But on the other end, 10 years later, I think that, that picks up a little bit at what we look at, no look, look at now is there's a lot of solution we invest which are probably, uh, which are at first within Europe, but which have the potential through technology in, 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 in digital health, in education, to then also tackle societal and environmental problems in the all over the globe. Do you have one in particular in, in mind? Uh, one example out of our portfolio is something in, in uh, psychological therapy for depression, anxiety. It's a company in the UK, and it's basically giving more people access to better uh, medical outcomes through technology, through artificial intelligence. And if that works, and, and the payer systems here can finance that, you can put that anywhere in the world where you basically have a phone, you know, the phone enables finance, education and health. And that's something maybe in 10 years will be in Africa, the model for depression, because I don't think there's many therapists for that mm. in, in Asia or in, in developing countries or uh, global south. How does artificial intelligence help with that, with um, depression? Um, yeah, there's two approaches. There's the Silicon Valley approach. They try to throw in um, AI to be a therapist, and that doesn't really work. Um, we come from the therapist side, or that company comes from the therapist side, from 
the, the Cambridge experts on that, and they basically step by step through collecting data, step by step invo um, include AI for um, triage and then quality control and matching of the right therapist to the right patient. And that's a step by step proce process, which is really different to thinking I can just write some code and heal someone from a psychological um, mm. challenge. That reminds me of something that um, Sophia commented on recently, I think, about the difference between good tech and bad tech, tech for good and tech for bad. Uh, tell us a bit about how you see that distinction. Well, every day, literally every day, um, I, I receive the same comment about what I do, which is, oh, but Sophia, every company has an impact, as long as you employ people. And, and so that's why I think a lot about this question. I'm like, no, every company has a use case. But, but it's difference between usage and an impact. So, so, and so, and uh, with some colleagues, and I, there's one I love, and it's not from me, um, uh, but they said, like, if you can, if the company get acquired by the worst company in the world, and we all have our own top three, right, the subjectivity part of it, uh, would you be able to take out the impact of the company? And if the answer is no, then that means that really, it's, it's at the core. So that's one answer, and the difference with WeTech, which is slightly different, again, is like, is the problem that the company is trying to solve really big, and um, in terms of number of people affected by it, and in terms of the complexity, and, and that is gonna require to, to solve it. So that's kind of two ways of saying it. Okay. Um, I wonder, Agli, given your experience across public and private in this space, we discussed perhaps giving the audience an overview of a bit the the sector because we're jumping we tend to jump around a bit but I think you're particularly well placed to given your um, parkour if you like and the, the, that's brought you to today to kind of give us an overall sense of what we're, we're really talking about here when we talk about impact investing in in Europe and perhaps the European uh, investment fund in particular and how that's the role that's played. Oh, that's <laughs> no, but you're, you're the, you are a teacher. I was I was told as well. So. <laughs> uh, maybe in 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 a nutshell, and I'll come just just to react also to to what Sophia just said. Uh, to me, at the core of impact, there is uh, if you look at the definition that has has been set up by the Jean um, a few years ago, there is there are these two words that matters, which is the intention to generate environmental and social impact alongside, alongside a financial re uh, return and to measure it, to be able to provide tangibility and alignment. And I think that's the two key words. And uh, um, just I think the question regarding emerging countries and, and developed countries w w w was interesting because we, we, have, we learned a lot from emerging countries actually in this world of impact field um, because uh, impacts may seem more natural in, in emerging market where, where, where there is a lack of public resources. However, it is also the case in, in Europe and you, you saw, I mean, large uh, public institutions such as, for instance, the European Investment Fund launched, um, it was in 2013, fund of funds targeting social enterprises, um, aiming at putting market standards in Europe. At that time, there were only few funds um, some of them mainly in the, in the Anglo-Saxon world, in, in the UK, in the Nordic countries. It's great to see that the situation is all evolving now and that you see more and more impact fund, especially in, in, in France, in Germany. Um, so yeah, the market has evolved and I think that I it's key because when also you, you hear what Amit was saying that we need today, I think the figure was tri tr three to five trillion per year um, to achieve the uh, sustainable uh, development goals is just means that you need to me a coalition of actors that the public states might not be able to achieve this gap alone and that impact businesses especially impact investors can play a key role to support the to support this transition especially thanks to the ability to innovate in a short period of time uh, I was interested uh, in Davos to see not only BlackRock's announcement, but JP Morgan's announcement about wanting to do 100 billion a year in supporting development environmental uh, projects. How did you assess the, the moment we lived in in January, you or any of the other panelists? Are these game changers or is this um, uh, business as usual under a, another name? Or do you want to? <laughs> So, so I w honestly, I wouldn't know about really what's um, behind that statement. Um, 
because I don't know them well enough. But what I can say is that, it, the again, thanks, Amy, for, for reminding us the numbers, but there's roughly 74, if I'm not wrong, trillion um, uh, asset under management in the world globally. And impact investing, and as it is defined, and there is, again, a different way to do it, but it's 500 uh, billion. So there is not even 1%, it's like 67 point, uh, well, not even 1% of the, the money that's allocated in what we're talking about. So for me, that's the problem. Like, these, we can talk about social as much as we want. The fundamental problem is that when someone has a solution, it's really, really hard to find money. So when I hear announcement like this, I think it's great. There's probably part of it that it won't go totally in what we might define as impact. But as long as there's a flow of capital, as long as we, we kind of stop sort of separating those two worlds, at least the way it's done today, I think it's overall positive because it will fuel that innovation and some of those innovations will be transformative for societies. Maybe <coughs> to add on that, um, I think and I hope there's a few and or even many entrepreneurs here, I think it's right now it's not a matter of young, innovative entrepreneurs trying to set something up in that impact space. They are really driven now, they understand, we know the world needs solutions, but they all, all understand you can build great businesses and change industries. So kind of from the deal flow side as a VC, how you would think, it's, it's all good. And on the other end, technically there's a lot of cash and money in the markets, everyone doesn't know what to do with it, but it didn't really arrive very good yet in this area, not only at, in, in our funds technically, but that allocation is still asynchronous to what the supply of startups is and still you have to filter through it and it, not everyone can get financing. Um, but that allocation has to change and you know EIF is an example. I don't see any other fund of funds. There's a lot of um, announcements what they do, the big ones out there and we talked to 10 years ago to JP Morgan and that. I, d I didn't see it arrive yet so I think it's, it's good discussion to have but that has to come with execution. And um, on the other end, the one good thing we see, maybe just a sidestep, um, is in Germany, the foundations, which are very active in impact technically. You know, we have the first investor now from BMW Foundation, which is a big step because German lawmakers limit that a little bit and everyone is scared that the, that the foundations do mission investing. There's billions in foundations sitting in the asset pools. And the asset pools have to work impact-wise, you know, have to be invested in impact also. Why are they scared? It's uh, there's technically a legal thing that if you do certain investments in PE that you don't have the uh, foundation status anymore, but that's actually there has been enough legal advice that it, it, it's not the case. It's like a little bit cultural history, I would say also. But it's happening, and that's also a huge pool of, of assets going into that impact market. Okay. Agley, you look like you wanted to say something and you didn't have a microphone. <laughs> I just wanted also to react to that. So, uh, Sophia just highlighted the fact that indeed impact uh, investment today only represents 1% or less than 1% of, of the overall assets under management. It looks like a niche. Um, I really hope and I'm convinced again that, that this will become mainstream and that it, will, it shouldn't be considered as an asset class but as an approach to investment uh, which integrates again uh, environmental and social uh, 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 pillar alongside uh, the, the, the financial one. Um, but it's true that, and that's why I think that investors have, have a key responsibility. So it's great to see more and more players. That there's always this question of, of critical size um, uh, and, and, and there is always a gap to be bridged to, to target smaller businesses. Uh, but, but I think that things are moving globally. You and I discussed about the way Raise is sometimes targeting people you wouldn't always expect when we talk about impact investing. Can you say a bit more about, yeah, about that? Yeah, just a word about um, the, the fund uh, um, I'm managing, which is called France de Z, which has recently been launched by the largest French foundation, the Fondation de France, and is managed by RAISED. The strategy of this fund is to target impact-driven businesses, but also um, more traditional businesses that are undergoing an environmental and social transition. Because we think that we may have a stronger global impact by also targeting these businesses which doesn't have access uh, which, which are not addressed by by uh, by these um, resources and this capital mm. 
And Sophia, I was wanted to ask your thinking about why you started Future Positive Capital. Well, I thought I would start a company. It's I see very much FPC as a company, but uh, I thought it would be more product or service. Uh, so that was sort of my plan A that I deviated slightly from. And um, sort of joined the tech company, um, ended up at Index Ventures. And there I just realized that just that funding gap that I was mentioning, that um, there is really still today an, um, a miss, um, misunderstanding of what we're talking about when we're talking back. If the company cannot produce high return from a VC perspective, which is a 10x, it, there is, it, this, is, this is what today we call most of the time an impact company, which is that solving a problem, sustainable business model, profitable, will not return people's money. And we mix that with like companies who solve big problems again, who can have that. So I realized that just it was a funding gap for this um, other type of companies that had that kind of fast growing pace and uh, that can definitely become those champions, but they were put in that category as well. So, um, and there was no fun in Europe. So we focused just in a nutshell in companies that develop product and services, but on the back of a very advanced technology so, and uh, that's being developed proprietary and, and we go kind of challenge those kind of problems. So, um, so and for this kind of companies, there's only around 15% of money allocated in Europe. So that's why I, I thought I'll try to bridge that gap a bit. Great. Um, I gather from the beep that we're coming close to the end. I was actually in Lyon for the Global Fund where they played music in the panelist headphones and it slowly got louder and we had one health minister who just kept talking. It must have been deaf by the end of the, the session. So we will conclude perhaps with Florian any closing thoughts. And um, I thought you and I discussed something interesting before the panel about the differences culturally between different European investors and you said that, that those differences have become less pronounced that you've seen in the past 10 years. Uh, yeah, I'll quickly start on that and then one more <laughs> comment. Um, yeah, 10 years ago when you talked to uh, the German potential investors in your fund who said you can't do good and make money, you know, they're very philanthropic on that side and careful. And then you talk to JP Morgan or someone from, from New York and said you have to make a lot of, lot of, lot of money. It was a little quite diverse um, cultural space you had to deal with when, when setting up a fund. I think it comes together now. People understand and that's kind of a little bit in the middle. Um, you know, funds are set up to make money, but it's not just to get rich. The topic is it has to be for profit and scalable businesses, and it has to be a for profit um, target behind it. Um, the other angle, just to touch it, which is an interesting development on the uh, on the on the cultural side, is that the mainstream funds are more and more looking into it, and it's an interesting viewpoint. It's a good thing they do it, but you have to watch, you know, who does it a little bit out of press and who really does it from the heart and having doing it, you know, as its internal DNA, which kind of is the definition of an impact fund that you have it with all your processes and and people that you work on impact investing. Where's the DNA of an impact fund? What you know it's it's first of all just look at the portfolio and talk to the founders. That's the simplest way to find it out. And we have set it up and like Sophia from the beginning that it's that we only invest and work with impact businesses and we want to have a positive change and do things which matter. Okay. Any closing thoughts from the other two panelists? Uh, any closing thoughts? Um, no, I just, Te just technically to say my job to have to closing thoughts, but I'd rather listen say to you. We, we are looking at businesses that are addressing urgent and important issues with a systemic solution. And I really think that impact businesses um, can play a key role um, in, 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 in financing these uh, and in can also contribute to, com to common goods. <laughs> I found one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, because I'm, I'm always trying to, to kind of see the difference, but I think maybe one again, just to clarify, but is there is some of you will think, because I'm thinking about what can you take away, that you want to solve a problem and find a model for it. And others might find that by solving a problem, you're creating a business. And that sounds like a subtle differentiation, but it's a big one. You know, one will open up a lot of capital because you, you're presenting and you, you're uh, approaching the problem like a market, you know, and that anyone will be interested in this. If you approach it from a place of like, uh, that, that was a social problem and I found a solution and a model, you might be um, um, like facing a, a funding um, challenge. Okay. <laughs> well, 
that's it from us. Wish you all a productive few days here, and uh, thanks for your attention.